answer done. Okay. So, with your permission, shall we start, Professor Abin? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. Before we start, I would uh, request all the guests to keep their mics off. Uh, they should switch on the mics only when it is their turn to speak. That will be easy for all of us. And uh, we'll be taking up questions after the lecture. So if you have any questions, type them in the comments section on our YouTube live telecast page. Uh, good evening once again. I welcome you all in the sixth lecture in Punjabi Diaspora Lecture Series 2022. Uh, the series is organized by the Center for Diaspora Studies, Punjabi University, Patiala. Uh, the series is an attempt to create dialogue between uh, the Punjabi Indian scholars working in different fields, sitting in various parts of the world, and the aspiring Punjabi scholars and Punjabi academia. Today, uh, we are fortunate to have with us Professor Harjant Gill. Dr. Gill is an associate professor of anthropology at Dawson University, USA. The topic of his lecture today is, in English, it is coming of age in macho land, media, masculinity, and transnationality in, transnationality in Northern India. And in Punjabi, Mardame Chugirde Chigabru Hona, Uttri Parat, which pushed the media Ate Par Desi Chak. The lecture is being telecast live from the YouTube channel of the Center for Diaspora Studies. Now, I would like to invite Professor Gurmukh to formally welcome everyone. Professor Gurmukh. Shukriya, Tanjit. Kalantame, as a device chancellor, Professor Arvind Huranda Bakbot, Swagat Titan Vat Kardan, Rebakt Kadea. Both the Pare, Doctor Hajant Huran Dabi Shukria, Unana Galan Kardia Kardiana, the personality both Changilagi, especially B, Mento Galan Karaya, the opening Keter de Bit Voti, Maharat Rakdia, Menu Mida, Kajado Sare Songe, Kushna Kush Hassel Zurur Karange, Unan Bare, my Tudiji Jan Karitona Sanji Karunga, did on the areas and expertise day, Oho, gender and sexuality, migration. Uh, transnationality te kam karde is to bina media studies uh, visual anthropology ona di visheshta de khetar ne te ek ona di uh, visheshta da hor khetar ethnographic film ha ona ne uh, kafi uh, mere khayal 5 ya 6 uh, film banaiyan ne main ona di detail thonu hune dassunga te jehda oh khas cheez ona de uh, padhai di ya oh eh ya ke kime jehda uh, mardama paana ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਪਪੂਲਰ ਕਲਚਰ ਆ ਤੇ ਬਾਹਰ ਜਾਣ ਦੀ ਝਾਕ ਆ ਇੱਕ ਦੂਜੇ ਨਾਲ ਰਲੀਆਂ ਮਿਲੀਆਂ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਨੇ ਇੱਕ ਦੂਜੇ ਨਾਲ ਟਕਰਾਉਂਦੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਤੇ ਇੱਕ ਦੂਜੇ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਹੋ ਕੇ ਇੱਕ ਖਾਸ ਰੂਪ ਉਹ ਲੈਂਦੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਫਿਲਮ ਮਰਦਿਸਤਾਨ ਆ ਮਾਚੋ ਲੈਂਡ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਇਸ ਨੂੰ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਦੇਖ ਸਕਦੇ ਹੋ ਕਿ ਜਦੋਂ ਸਾਰੇ ਕਿਤੇ ਚੁਗਿਰਦਾ ਪੁਰਸ਼ ਤਬ ਦੇ ਦੇ ਪ੍ਰਭੂ ਤਬ ਦਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਉਹਦੀ ਗਾਲਬੀਅਤ ਦਾ ਹੋਵੇ ਤਾਂ ਉਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਜਗ੍ਹਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਵੱਡੇ ਹੋਣ ਦਾ ਕੀ ਮਤਲਬ ਹੈ ਕਿਹੜੇ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਤੇ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ਼ਰਸ ਨੇ ਕਿਹੜੇ ਹੋਰ ਜੈਂਡਰ ਪਛਾਣਾਂ ਦੇ ਉੱਪਰ ਪ੍ਰੈਸ਼ਰ ਆਉਂਦੇ ਨੇ ਤਾਂ ਇਹ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਇੱਕ ਖੇਤਰ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਿਨਾ ਇੱਕ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੋਰ ਖੂਬਸੂਰਤ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਐਥਨੋਗ੍ਰਾਫਿਕ ਫਿਲਮ ਆ ਰੂਟਸ ਆਫ ਲਵ ਕਿ ਇੱਕ ਖਾਸ ਭਾਈਚਾਰੇ ਦੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਲਈ ਦਸਤਾਰ ਦਾ ਤੇ ਬਾਲਾਂ ਦਾ ਕੀ ਅਰਥ ਹੋ ਸਕਦਾ ਉਹ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਉਸ ਡਾਕੂਮੈਂਟਰੀ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਐਕਸਪਲੋਰ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕੀਤੀ ਆ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਡਾਕੂਮੈਂਟਰੀ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਨਿੱਜੀ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਪਸੰਦ ਆਈ ਆ ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਮਾਈਗ੍ਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਤੇ ਬਣਾਈ ਆ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਉਹ 2016 ਚ ਬਣੀ ਸੀ ਜਦੋਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਹੁਣ ਦੇਖਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਅੱਜ ਦੇ ਦੌਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਤਾਂ ਉਹਦੀ ਅਹਿਮੀਅਤ ਹੋਰ ਵੀ ਵੱਧ ਬਣ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਆ ਸੈਂਟ ਅਵੇ ਬੋਇਜ਼ ਕਿਵੇਂ ਮਤਲਬ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੀ ਧਰਤੀ ਤੋਂ ਜਦੋਂ ਜਾ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਸਾਰੇ ਜਾਣੇ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਮਰਦ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਜਾ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਤਾਂ ਪਿੱਛੋਂ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦਾ ਕੀ ਹਾਲ ਹੋ ਜਾਣਾ ਉਸ ਫਿਲਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਬਜ਼ੁਰਗ ਮਾਤਾ ਤੇ ਜਦੋਂ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਹੀ ਦ੍ਰਿਸ਼ ਫਿਲਮ ਦਾ ਆਉਂਦਾ ਤੇ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਉਪਰੋਂ ਲਿਆ ਗਿਆ ਤੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਹੈਰਾਨ ਰਹਿ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਹੋ ਕਿ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਜੇ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਹੋਜੂਗਾ ਤੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਮਤਲਬ ਉਦਾਸ ਕਰਨ ਵਾਲਾ ਹੋਊਗਾ ਤੇ ਉਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਇਹ ਵੀ ਸਮਝਣ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕੀਤੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਕਿੰਨੇ ਪੱਖ ਨੇ ਜਦੋਂ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਸ ਗੱਲ ਨੂੰ ਸਮਝਣਾ ਕਿ ਕਿਉਂ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚੋਂ ਲੋਕ ਬਾਹਰ ਜਾ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਚਾਹੇ ਇਨਸਿਕਿਉਰਿਟੀ ਹੋਵੇ ਬੇਰੋਜ਼ਗਾਰੀ ਹੋਵੇ ਜਾਂ ਇਹ ਡਿਸਕੋਰਸ ਹੀ ਹੋਵੇ ਕਿ ਹੁਣ ਧਰਤੀ ਜਿਉਣ ਜੋਗੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਰਹੀ ਤਾਂ ਉਹ ਕਈ ਸਾਰੇ ਪੱਖਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੇ ਉਸ ਫਿਲਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ
ਤਾਂ ਇੱਕ ਅਕੈਡਮਿਸ਼ੀਅਨ ਦਾ ਤੇ ਫਿਲਮ ਮੇਕਰ ਦਾ ਤੇ ਟੀਚਰ ਦਾ ਤਿੰਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਸ਼ਖਸੀਅਤ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਹੋਣਾ ਮੇਰੇ ਖਿਆਲ ਇਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਦੁਰਲੱਭ ਚੀਜ਼ ਆ ਸਾਡੇ ਇੱਧਰ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾਂ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਅਸੀਂ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਸੁਪਨਾ ਤਾਂ ਲੈਨੇ ਆ ਕਿ ਹੁਣ ਨਵੇਂ ਦੌਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਦੋਂ ਵਿਜ਼ੂਅਲ ਦੀ ਸਰਦਾਰੀ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਵਿਜ਼ੂਅਲ ਵੀ ਬਹੁਤ ਗਹਿਰੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਕੋਲ ਹੋਵੇ ਪਰ ਹਲੇ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਉਨੀਆਂ ਵਰਤਨੀਆਂ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੋਈਆਂ ਤੇ ਇੱਕ ਗੱਲ ਹੋਰ ਕਿ ਜਦੋਂ ਸਾਡੇ ਅਕੈਡਮਿਸ਼ੀਅਨਸ ਕਹਾ ਸਟੋਰੀ ਟੈਲਰ ਬਣਦੇ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਇਹ ਇਸ ਕਰਕੇ ਖਾਸ ਹੋ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਕਿ ਕਹਾਣੀ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਕੋਲ ਆਪਣੀਆਂ ਕਹਾਣੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਹੈਗੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਤੇ ਕਹਾਣੀ ਕਹਿਣ ਦੀ ਸਮਰੱਥਾ ਹੈਗੀ ਆ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਲਈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਅਗਾਹ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਜਾ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਗਹਿਰਾ ਬਣਾ ਸਕਦੇ ਆ ਜੇ ਕਿਸੇ ਹੋਰ ਦੀਆਂ ਸਟੋਰੀਆਂ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਕੋਲ ਹੋਣਗੀਆਂ ਜਾਂ ਤੁਹਾਡੀਆਂ ਕਹਾਣੀਆਂ ਕੋਈ ਹੋਰ ਦੱਸੂਗਾ ਤਾਂ ਉਹ ਤੁਹਾਡੀ ਪ੍ਰਮਾਣਿਕ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਰਿਪਰੈਜ਼ੈਂਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਆ ਉਹ ਸ਼ਾਇਦ ਨਾ ਹੋ ਸਕੇ ਤਾਂ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਪਰਸਨੈਲਿਟੀ ਨੂੰ ਅਸੀਂ ਅੱਜ ਸੈਂਟਰ ਵੱਲੋਂ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਰੂਬਰੂ ਕਰਨ ਦਾ ਮਾਣ ਲੈ ਰਹੇ ਹਾਂ ਤੇ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਬਹੁਤ ਖੁਸ਼ੀ ਹੋਊਗੀ ਕਿ ਖਾਸ ਤੌਰ ਤੇ ਕਿ ਸਾਡੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਅਗਲੀ ਜਨਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਆ ਉਹ ਡਾਇਸਪੋਰਾ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਕੰਮ ਕਰ ਰਹੀ ਆ ਉਸ ਪੱਖੋਂ ਵੀ ਇਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਚੰਗੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੋਊਗੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਹੁਣ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਸੁਣਾਂਗੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਬਹੁਤ ਸ਼ੁਕਰੀਆ ਪਰ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਅਰਵਿੰਦ ਥੋਰਾ ਨੂੰ ਸੁਣਾਂਗੇ ਧੰਨਜੀਤ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਬਾਲ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਗੁਰਮੁਖ ਆਈ ਵੁਡ ਨਾਓ ਰਿਕੁਐਸਟ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਅਰਵਿੰਦ ਟੂ ਗਿਵ ਹਿਸ ਇੰਟਰੋਡਕਟਰੀ ਰਿਮਾਰਕਸ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਅਰਵਿੰਦ ਸੀ ਪੀਪਲ ਸੇ ਥੈਟ ਹਾਊ ਡੂ ਐਕਟੀਵਿਟੀਜ਼ ਰਨ ਵਾਈ ਆਰ ਸੋ ਮੈਨੀ ਅਕੈਡਮਿਕ ਐਕਟੀਵਿਟੀਜ਼ ਹੈਪਨਿੰਗ ਇਨ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਇਨ ਦੀ ਪਾਸਟ ਮੰਥਸ ਵੈਨ ਦ ਗ੍ਰਾਂਟ ਹੈਸ ਨਾਟ ਕਮ ਥਿਸ ਕੁਐਸਚਨ ਹੈਸ ਬੀਨ ਆਸਕਡ ਟੂ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਬਾਈ from many quarters and from many angles uh, one of the angle has been that uh, you know how it is happening with a positive how i mean good it's happening and it's why it's happening another one has been why are we doing it at all uh, when we are in a uh, financial crisis and i must say that the activities of dash for a center is something uh, which is happening in that way uh, that uh, we have revived the center with the almost a zero budget proposal because the government of india is unlikely to revive the grant for such centers they have a policy however the activities are going very well because activities are primarily academic in nature and academic activities always don't need a lot of money they need the little money so i always say in many contexts and in this context also i would like to say the same thing that horse has to be before the cart it is the academic uh, activity of a university or a center or a department which is the horse which pulls the whole whole activity and then of course uh, you need many other many other things so the fuel for academic activity is not really money fuel for academic activity is the uh, is it in our minds it is our desire to to take it I want to congratulate the diaspora center for continuing to engage with various people across the world who come from broadly the punjabi diaspora we have also collaborated with iit khadakpur to organize partition lecture series we have brought in various kinds of people on board and uh, this is going to build up our connectivity with the punjabi community across the world and then we are going to connect everyone with the university that is the next step that we will take uh but it's very important because uh, in today's world uh, communities are uh, diaspora they are uh, people go from one place to another place and recently in a discussion that we were having on 1st of february on the mother tongue day i was saying that we have to talk about uh, local language versus my old language versus a global language this whole idea of a mother tongue or a ma boli itself is kind of uh, ill placed maybe as a concept because uh, what about a migrant laborer who was born in ludhiana whose parents come from uttar pradesh studies in a school punjabi school in punjab what is that child's language is it uh, bihari or is it punjabi so these questions have to be asked uh, and i don't know the answers uh, all i'm saying is that we have to maybe broaden these concepts completely in the light of the fact that uh, migrations can happen at a very short time scale people can go out and live in different places earlier it also used to happen but it used to happen at a certain time scale and those time scales were much longer compared to the cultural time scales and therefore the process was very different 
and typically when people left they left and then maybe they connected back after a decade or two or three or maybe after generations at times i mean there is a very interesting community in uh, uh, in central asia uh, which is punjabi in origin and they went there several hundred years ago and they speak a language which is a mix of punjabi and uh, central asian languages so those kind of things used to happen earlier now um, that is not what would happen because of uh, many people choose to uh, call themselves from the place from where they have come many others feel that they met better assimilate and integrate to where they go and that's what they should adopt uh, and that's why it's very so after all at the end of the day we are all one one community called humans and uh, within that uh, all these tensions all these uh, possibilities all these contradictions uh, in some sense are the are the motifs or the engines which drive literature films all kinds of activities production of knowledge and whatever you may want to call it. so in this context i think it's very important to bring different kinds of people on board and have a have listen to them record their lectures have a discussion and uh, punjabi university being uh, punjabi university is uh, very much interested in uh, punjabis and uh, punjabi speaking people or punjabi origin people wherever they may be in the world so therefore uh, let's listen to today's talk uh, and engage with it and uh, this build up that we are doing with these sessions uh, i think we will then consolidate our position and connect with these people and those who are connecting with us through these lectures and build a community around punjabi university punjabi university needs a community of punjabis around it for its long term survival and as i always say that if punjabi university connects with punjabis and punjabis call this as their university then the it's it's a win win situation for both so with these words i welcome today's speaker and congratulate the organizers for continuing to move in a certain direction which is useful for the center for the university and also for the diaspora i believe thank you thank you professor arvind so now without wasting any time i would like to invite uh, to this speaker dr hajant gill uh, dr gill thank you thank you so much i want to begin by thanking the center for diaspora studies uh, dr dharamjeet uh, singh dr gurmukh singh as well as vice chancellor chancellor dr arvind for giving me the opportunity to come and share my research and my work with you today So uh, if you just give me one second I just want to start um I will just show my presentation here um as we get started and I hope everybody can see the presentation uh, okay yes so, um, great. wonderful so I want to actually begin uh with a note on language which is what Dr um Arvind brought up and um I want to apologize first of all you know i'm giving this presentation at punjabi university patiala via zoom sitting here in washington dc uh and i want to apologize because i'm not going to be giving this presentation in punjabi um you see i was born and raised in chandigarh punjab and um i spent much of my my youth formative years in punjab and um and when i was growing up there um you know uh, i was sent to my parents uh you know as many uh, punjabi parents these days are doing they sent me to english medium schools so i started out in a convent school then we went to st xavier's which was a catholic school and then at some point my dad had this realization that oh my god my sons don't speak or they don't uh, they can't read or write in punjabi right and uh, so they took us out of st xavier's and put us in um uh shwali public where we got maybe a year of punjabi before you know we were we migrated to california at the age of 14 so um i have this interesting relationship with punjabi where um i i can read and write in punjabi just enough actually re- i can read it enough that i can a, a very very slowly in in a very elementary way where i can tell you know which direction the bus is headed when i'm traveling in punjab to do my research <laughs> but i'm not proficient enough to be able to give an academic talk and lecture in the language um the irony 
uh, of this is that uh, when I moved to... I'm, I'm, taking, uh, I'm taking the liberty of interjecting Dr. Gill. Yeah, but, please. But... Uh, ਅਸੀਂ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਚ ਬਾਈ ਇਮਰਸ਼ਨ ਬਹੁਤ ਸਾਰੇ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ origin ਦੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਇਕੱਠੇ ਕਰਕੇ ਤੇ ਉੱਥੇ ਲਿਆਉਣਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਉਹ ਆਪਣੀ ਹਰ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਚ ਕਰਨ ਚ ਕੰਫਰਟੇਬਲ ਮਹਿਸੂਸ ਕਰਨ ਵੀ ਵਿਲ ਵੈਰੀ ਸੂਨ ਡੂ ਸਚ ਅ ਥਿੰਗ ਐਂਡ ਗੈਟ ਯੂ ਬਟ ਗੋ ਅਹੈਡ ਇਨ ਇੰਗਲਿਸ਼ ਡਜ਼ਨਟ ਮੈਟਰ ਲੈਂਗੁਏਜ ਸ਼ੁਡ ਨਾਟ ਬੀ ਅ ਬੈਰੀਅਰ ਦ ਵੈਰੀ ਪਰਪਸ ਆਫ ਲੈਂਗੁਏਜ ਇਜ਼ ਟੂ ਇੰਗੇਜ ਐਂਡ ਟੂ ਬੀ ਅੰਡਰਸਟੂਡ ਪਲੀਜ਼ ਐਂਡ ਐਂਡ ਆਈ ਆਈ ਵੈਲਕਮ ਦੈਟ ਓਪਰਚੁਨਿਟੀ ਐਂਡ ਆਲ ਜਸਟ ਕੁਇਕਲੀ ਸੇ ਦੈਟ ਥਿਸ ਇਜ਼ ਵਨ ਆਫ ਦਿ ਟੈਂਸ਼ਨਸ ਦੈਟ ਆਈ ਐਕਚੁਅਲੀ um work out uh, um in my research as well right this is one of the the language the tension around language is something that i'm looking at in my work particularly as it relates to this issue of migration right this simultaneous um kind of understanding uh, um most punjabis have this uh you know sense of pride and um this sense of um you know this need to preserve and protect and speak your Punjabi your Maboli but at the same time you know when you travel through Punjab all of the the uh, the sign boards and all of the you know um, billboards advertise learn to speak English right so and 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 so the 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 um the message that a lot of young Punjabi men particularly get is that English is the social capital that you need in order to be successful you know and in fact in one of my films there is a young man who i and and part of that is also related to this kind of colonial legacy of english you know and also and especially in a city like chandigarh this which is thought of as a as a a modern city you know as a knowledge society where you can go and access that 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 language right um or the the linguistic um uh training that you need to be a successful migrant and so the the other point that i wanted to make is that even though um you know i grew up studying learning in english when i arrived in the us and i started college here i realized that my english was actually not good enough <laughs> to be able to you know express my ideas uh eloquently and clearly in writing i was a terrible i was terrible at writing in english at that time you know in when i started uh, college at san francisco state university So as a result of that I became a filmmaker you know and I became interested in visual images because I felt like the visual medium was the medium that I could express myself as well as interrogate these ideas that I wanted to explore you know so that if in case you're you know wondering how is it that I ended up becoming a filmmaker and what was my journey to visual anthropology it was actually because you know i never felt comfortable enough in punjabi and then <laughs> i also had this deep insecurity of english which i've worked to overcome over the years you know and i've now really appreciated and learned how to write and write well which takes tremendous amount of effort and time so um and that's something this this idea of language and and this tension of language is something that i explore in my in my research as well and as i said there's a kind of colonial mentality and in in my film there was a a, a participant his name is young man named by the name of rana and you know he was he had tried and tried and tried he couldn't get enough bands on his ielts exam or ielt exams to be able to qualify for a student visa and at one moment when i asked him you know how did he feel about english he said you know pichle zamane de vich sanu angrez sanu marde sige I just know Angrezi ne maria hoya you know and I thought that was such an eloquent way of kind of conveying this 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 I don't want to say schizophrenic but almost kind of this 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 juncture that we have with language in Punjab um and 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 the way in which it plays a role in shaping our future and um and ideas of success as well as shaping the notion of masculinity so let me get started with that um my work my ethnographic research and work as i said i was born and raised in in chandigarh um i spent a fair amount of time traveling in punjab uh, initially early on as uh, you know um as going back to my parents village but then later on in 2009 is when i started my ethnographic research and field study and a lot of it is outside of chandigarh a lot of it is based in moga and what is known as the the malwa region of um Punjab where i look at what it you know what 
in what it entails to become a, a young man. And, um, you know, and the process of becoming men is something that is sort of ongoing, right? And um, it starts out in some ways, it starts out um, within this kind of rural settings. I look at experiences of young Punjabi Sikh men in rural settings, growing up in, in families, joint family households, and the kind of um, uh, narratives they understand about what it means to be a young man, how they learn masculinity, you know, uh, through their, their, their father as well as within their peer groups. But also I look at how masculinity is produced and performed outside of regional settings as well within a more kind of contemporary, uh, more urban settings such, such as Chandigarh where young men for the first time, they leave their parents' household and move to Chandigarh perhaps to, you know, um, go to college and attend university or to like kind of do a course, you know, to be able to, to clear their ILET exams, you know? And this is their first opportunity to be able to kind of um, ex uh, sort of engage with the question of what it means to be a man and explore their notion, uh, their, their sexuality and their masculinity outside of the, the domestic sphere of their home, you know, away from your, the kind of surveilling eyes of their parents. And um, so I, I sort of look at this kind of transition from rural to urban and, and from urban to transnational, right? The, the, the process of uh, masculinity uh, formation or coming of age goes on and on even when they, and as they move to urban city and then eventually move abroad, right? Um, and as, I, as um, uh, Dr. Gurmukh has already pointed out, uh, the outcome of my research of these various points at times when I've done research has been these three documentary films. And I hope to show you a little uh, snippet of uh, all three of the films. So let me begin first by a clip from the film Mardistan. And this film was really made in 2014. And um, I made this film um, partly in response to the kind of rhetoric that I was hearing after the 2012 gang rape in New Delhi um, around Indian and Punjabi masculinity as well, but also just Indian masculinity in general the way in which um, masculinity was framed um, through this kind of very binary tropes of, you know, Indian men are either the, the predators or the protectors of women's honor. And I felt like in my research and my work, you know, I saw masculinity to be incredibly, or my understanding of masculinity was quite complex. You know, the men that I have known in my life are quite, um, you know, they have a, a far more nuanced understanding of what it means to be a man. And I felt like that was not necessarily being conveyed um, in the kind of uh, media discourse and the social media discourse that followed that particular event that received global coverage, you know, in some ways that, 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 uh, uh, that violent incident received um, uh, quite a bit of coverage abroad. And I was really fascinated by that. And so I made this film Madhistan not necessarily as a kind of uh, response to it, but also an attempt to have a kind of public dialogue and discourse on what it means to be a man and the kind of and, and explore the nuances of what it means to be a man and also to showcase that there's not only one way of being a man, right? Like you can't, uh, uh, there's not this sort of idea of um, the, the kind of man, uh, Indian man is the predator who, uh, you know, uh, sort of um, dis dis dishonors women, and then Indian man is the the protector, you know, who preserves um, uh, uh, women's sexuality. And I wanted to break out of that binary notion, so I want to show you a clip from that, and then we'll talk. I'll talk more about what it, you know, what it means to live in Macho Land or Madhistan, You know this concept of macho land as I've been sort of trying to develop over the years. While growing up, I realized there was a certain kind of men I would not like to become. I would not like to become an uncle of mine who would beat my mother up. I would not like to become a senior of mine who would define himself by sodomizing a junior. I would not like to pull a gun on somebody because I have had a gun pulled on me. I know what fear feels like. ਸਾਡੇ ਸਮਾਜ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਲੜਕਾ ਤੇ ਲੜਕੀ ਦਾ ਫਰਕ ਹੈ ਨਾ ਇਹ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਤੋਂ ਹੀ ਚੱਲਦਾ ਆਇਆ ਪੁਰਾਣੇ ਜ਼ਮਾਨੇ ਚ ਕੀ
ਤਾਂ ਉਦੋਂ ਹੀ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਗਲਾ ਕੋਟ ਕੇ ਮਾਰ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਸੀ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਪੈਦਾ ਹੋਣ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਮਾਰਿਆ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਸੀ ਅੱਜ ਕੱਲ ਕੁਕਟੀ ਮਾਰ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਸਾਡੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਦੀ ਸੋਚ ਨਹੀਂ ਬਦਲੀ ਸਿਰਫ ਤਰੀਕੇ ਬਦਲ ਗਏ ਨੇ ਜਦੋਂ ਇਹ ਵਾਲਾ ਟੌਪਿਕ ਛੱਡਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਵਰਜਿਨ ਹੋ ਜਾਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਉਦੋਂ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਦਿੱਤਾ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਸਾਨੂੰ ਇੱਕ ਉਹ ਟਾਸਕ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਕਲੀਅਰ ਨਹੀਂ ਕੀਤਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਲਾਈਫ ਦਾ ਕਿ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਸਭ ਤੋਂ ਜ਼ਰੂਰੀ ਸੀਗਾ ਜੇ ਕੋਈ ਮੁੰਡਾ ਕਹਿੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਨਹੀਂ ਕੀਤਾ ਤਾਂ ਉਹਦੀ ਇਮੇਜ ਐਵੇਂ ਜੀ ਬਣ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਯਾਰ ਇਹ ਤਾਂ ਛੱਕਾ ਹੈ ਇਸ ਤੋਂ ਕੁਝ ਹੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੋ ਸਕਦਾ ਫੈਨ ਯੂ ਗਰੋ ਅਪ ਟੂ ਬਿਕਮ ਅ ਮੈਨ ਯੂ ਲਰਨ ਦੈਟ देयर ਆਰ ਸਰਟਨ ਰਿਵਾਰਡਸ ਯੂ ਗੈਟ ਇਫ ਯੂ ਫਾਲੋ ਦ ਰੂਲਸ ਲਰਨਿੰਗ ਟੂ ਬਿਕਮ ਅ ਵੂਮਨ ਇਜ਼ ਡਿਫਰੈਂਟ ਯੂ ਲਰਨ ਦੈਟ ਇਫ ਯੂ ਡੋਨਟ ਫਾਲੋ ਦ ਰੂਲਸ ਯੂ ਵਿਲ ਬੀ ਪਨਿਸ਼ਡ ਇਫ ਯੂ ਫਾਲੋ ਦ ਰੂਲਸ ਯੂ ਕੈਨ ਸਰਵਾਈਵ ਵੇਅਰਸ ਵਿਦ ਮੈਨ ਵੈਨ ਯੂ ਲਰਨ ਪਲੇ ਦ ਗੇਮ ਬਾਈ ਦ ਰੂਲਸ ਯੂ ਐਕਚੁਅਲੀ ਦ ਰਿਵਾਰਡਸ ਆਰ ਕੁਆਇਟ ਫੈਨੋਮਨਲ ਜਦ ਵੀ ਮੈਂ ਘਰ ਸੇ ਬਾਹਰ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਥਾ ਤੋ ਮੁਝੇ ਸਭ ਲੋਕ ਛੱਕਾ ਹੀ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਥੇ ਇਹ ਹਿਜੜਾ ਹੈ ਛੱਕਾ ਹੈ ਜਾਂ ਤੋ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਸੇ ਕੀ ਜੋ ਬੁਲਿੰਗ ਹੋਤੀ ਥੀ ਪਿਛੇ ਸੇ ਕੋਈ ਵੀ ਵਰਡਸ ਬੋਲ ਦੇਤੇ ਥੇ ਗਲਤ ਮੇਰੇ ਲਈ ਤੋ ਸਮਾਜ ਮੇ ਜੋ ਇਹ ਐਜ਼ ਅ ਗੇ ਮੈਨ ਮੇਰੀ ਕੋਈ ਇੱਕ ਕੋਈ ਜਗ੍ਹਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਸਮਾਜ ਮੇ ਹੋਮੋਸੈਕਸ਼ੁਅਲ ਕੇ ਲਈ ਕੋਈ ਜਗ੍ਹਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੈ ਪਰ ਉਸਕੋ ਸਮਾਜ ਕਾ ਇੱਕ ਹਿੱਸਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਮੰਨਿਆ ਜਾਂਦਾ So um as you can see the the question that I my work um explores is what does it mean to be a man in Punjab and um and in doing that I try to kind of characterize Punjab as well as broadly northern India as macho land or mardistan and um and and when i say when i refer to punjab as macho land or mardistan what i'm talking about is not just that um men in northern india and in punjab are a privileged vis-a-vis women and other sexual minorities other other gender minorities um they are they enjoy male supremacy punjab is a kind of um um uh you know a very patriarchal culture historically a patriarchal culture um those things are certainly true but what i also try to convey in my kind of definition of macho land is that uh these 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 expectations this uh structures of patriarchy heterosexual patriar- patriarchy uh you know they also restrict the kind of life choices that punjabi men or men in india broadly are uh, allowed to make right um the kind of decisions that they can make it accompanies with it a tremendous amount of responsibility towards your family towards you know your partner towards um kids uh your your children and that constricts the kind of life choices one can make uh you know and an a, a sort of a very visible manifestation of that is this um the institution of uh heterosexual arranged marriage and the expectation that uh you one would marry um not just in accordance to your your parents desire but also in accordance to to the kind of caste and class hierarchies that are also in place uh, so in some ways um you know patriarchal masculinity works in tandem with caste hierarchy and uh caste distinctions and in this you know men are not especially talking to especially young men you know they're not uh allowed to be able to pursue the kind of or make the choices that they want to make in terms of who they want to marry how they want to marry you know what kind of sexual lives they want to live you know you definitely don't have a space for to be gay you don't have the space to be able to um you know uh, uh sort of engage in love marriage and um it also is in my attempt to problematize this notion of this term toxic masculinity which has entered our the kind of popular discourse over the past um few years and um i find the language of toxic toxic masculinity quite limiting because it implies in some ways that um you know men are you know beyond repair right like once you become toxic you know it sort of in some ways um i think um the work of indipa grewal who writes about um honor killings in her article uh, outsourcing patriarchy is useful to also look at toxic masculinity and its application within kind of punjabi context because 
what it does is it obscures, when you say something is toxically masculine or the men are toxically masculine, it obscures some of the other um, systems that are in play. You know, it is the kind of violence that we're talking about that, you know, we characterize as toxic masculinity is just um, caste or class violence, or it is just um, gender or sexual violence, or it is a form of domestic violence, right? And by characterizing it as toxic masculinity, it makes it sound exceptional and it makes it sound like as if it is culturally contextual. And I think that it doesn't, it does us, does us a disservice to sort of say, well, you know, Punjabi men are just toxically masculine. This is a, it is a, um, this is an outcome of toxic masculinity or this thing is toxically masculine and therefore we just should do away with it, right? And what does that mean to do away with it? And um, last but not least, the third aspect of looking at um, or exploring this notion of uh, Punjab as macho land or this idea of thinking about spaces in gender terms, um, I look at um, what is the process through which young men young boys learn how to become men, the process we refer to as coming of age, right? And so this is something that I've been thinking about and I've been, I'm writing about um, and, and what follows now is going to be a version of sort of parts of my book that I'm currently working on, which is coming of age in macho land, right? And for me, the, the process of coming of age is in many ways ongoing. And the, the, the title of the book, for those of you, you know, who are anthropologists, uh, you know, you'll realize that it's actually a reference to uh, Margaret Mead's uh, 1928 book, Coming of Age in Samoa, which is one of the seminal books in anthropology that's been written about um, sort of adolescent sexuality. And my attempt is to not kind of reproduce, you know, somebody like Margaret Mead's work, but to further problematize um, these kind of um, you know, these ethnographies that were conducted in a time period where, you know, you had an outsider anthropologist coming in and looking at a particular society and community without really questioning their own position within that society or community, right? Um, Margaret Mead never really interrogates, you know, like what are the processes, what are the colonial processes that are in play that took her to Samoa where she's under, she's exploring these um, uh, women's lives and she sort of, in some ways, and I think we can um, forgive her for that because of the time period when the book was written, but I think one of the critiques of the book is particularly that it sort of treats sexuality and adolescence, um, female adolescent sexuality as a kind of fixed thing that happens over there in, in Samoa. And uh, my work, uh, in my work, um, you know, the way I talk about masculinity and uh, sexuality for me, it's an ongoing process and it's very much informed by my own experience as a Punjabi man and uh, having grown up in Punjab and now um, living in the United States, coming back as an ethnographer, in some ways a native ethnographer, but still being an outsider, trying to understand and explore what it means to come of age in Punjabi society, right? Um, so I should say that, you know, um, here, um, the book um, draws on my own personal biography um, in this question of coming of age and what it means to be a Punjabi man has fascinated me for a very long time. You know, I grew up in a, in a traditional Sikh family in India, and uh, I, from very early on, I knew that I was queer or I'm, I'm gay and something that um, I, you know, after moving to the US, I came out to my parents and something that I've always been, I've, I've been very open about, uh, yet the person who sort of embodied that kind of patriarchal masculinity in my family was my grandfather, who you see pictured here on the left-hand side, my papaji, you know, and he was a superintendent of Punjab jails in, in a retired superintendent of Punjab jails. He unfortunately passed away last year because of COVID, but I had a very, very special relationship with my papaji, you know, and he was sort of the patriarch of, of our, our sort of Sikh family. And he lived in Chandigarh his entire life. And very proud of the fact that he built his house in Chandigarh. And he had this, uh, you know, uh, 
he was somebody that I was simultaneously afraid of and respected and loved, you know, uh, and, and I had a very special relationship with him because I, I was the one who was visiting him most often whenever I'd go back to Chandigarh to do my research. I spent time with him and he had this very acerbic tone where simultaneously he could be very cruel and um, biting in his critique. He could talk down to you, you know, as a Punjabi man and he'd ex exert his class and caste privilege, you know, uh, and at the same time, he could be very loving and, and, and very sweet, you know, depending on when you, when you, um, you know, met him and talked to him uh, during the day, right? Uh, if he had a couple of uh, uh, pegs of whiskey, which he drank every day, you know, his entire life, he was, he was a little bit more calm. Um, and, and one of the things that my Papaji uh, felt that in some ways we all failed him in is, you know, um, uh, sort of not sticking to this, uh, our kind of religious, um, identity by cutting our hair, you know, so he was throughout his entire life, he was very angry at us for, and in some ways, he felt like I, we had betrayed this, what it means to be a Punjabi man or a Sikh man, because we had, my father had cut us, cut our hair right before we immigrated to the US. And because, you know, um, my father has cut his own hair, and that was a, a tremendous betrayal to him, you know, uh, and betrayal to what to in, in some ways to him, what it means to be a Punjabi Sikh man, you know? Um, and then uh, over the time, my Papaji, uh, you know, despite the fact that, you know, I started out as a graduate student and then got my PhD, you know, and, and I, even though I'm out to my parents, I never came out to my Papaji. Um, and even though I'd gotten my PhD, I started working as a professor, he felt like, there was something always incomplete in my masculinity because I wasn't married, you know? Every time I'd go back to, to Chandigarh and Punjab, he would pressure me to get married to the point that he actually took out an advertisement in the matrimonial section of Punjab Tribune, you know? And I found this really interesting to find me, a, a, he took it upon himself to find me a bride, you know? So he felt in his mind that uh, all the other accomplishments, all the professional accomplishments that I had, uh, none of those mattered because they were overshadowed by um, this, you know, lack that I had in my life of not being married to a woman and not having kids. And up until very, his last moment, he was really angry with me that I wouldn't, I refused to get married, right? And that speaks to the way in which, um, you know, the point that I was making that um, uh, Punjab is a macho land. When we talk about Punjab as a macho land, there are these expectations that are placed upon young men, particularly this expectation that you'd get married and married to somebody of your own caste or class, you know, that many young men are, I see actively trying to resist and reject, right? And even though we think of transnational migration and this idea that, um, you know, you'd leave India to, uh, or leave Punjab to migrate abroad with, through very economic terms, right? Because the conditions, the social conditions and uh, economic conditions in Punjab are really bad. They're not, there are no uh, opportunities for young men uh, in Punjab, which is, which all of which is true. I look at migration as yet simultaneously a choice that young men make to at least for temporarily postpone this pressures of macho land, right? To, get away from the kind of restrictions and constrictions and the limitations that are placed upon them because of patriarchal masculinity, right? Um, and, I, and I think this, this speaks to this kind of contradiction that if you grow up in a society where men are privileged, they have all the power, all the you know, resources, um, they are affluent, I mean, especially Jat families, they're fairly affluent. They have everything that's given to them you know, they enjoy, um, you know, uh, um, uh, they, are, they enjoy all sorts of privileges. Why would they want to leave, right? Why is there such a compulsion in Punjab for young men to leave Punjab if they grow up in a society where they have privilege and power, right? And if we, if we sidestep and not, um, not thinking about the economic 
um, issue, you know, it's sort of economic choices that people make. It's also cultural, you know, we, I, I sort of think about migration through these cultural lenses and particularly gendered lenses uh, or gendered ideas, this desire to not follow the same script that has been written for them, um, you know, um, by society in terms of what they want to do, how, uh, how they ought to live their lives, right? And this is not to excuse the kind of violence that young men enact um, onto uh, women and um, sexual minorities. You know, I will, I'm not saying that this is an excuse, but I do think that if we are trying to understand uh, masculinity and if we're trying to understand sexual or domestic violence um, and sort of male violence, we need to take these things and consider these things in a more nuanced way as opposed to just sort of saying that this is toxic masculinity and hence we, we shouldn't talk about it. And um, so, my book actually starts off with an example, one such example of this kind of um, violence uh, that happened in 2019 in uh, this village, Natuala um, Garbi, uh, um, right? Uh, and this was a, a, an incident where a 28-year-old 20 man killed five of his family members before he committed suicide. And, um, and the, I think the only person who survived was his the, the grandfather in in, in and uh, you know who sort of narrates what had happened that particular night. And I found what I found really interesting was the media coverage of this particular incident. Um, and I'm not sure if you guys remember or if people remember. Yeah, the news was quite. It was all over media for maybe a couple of days, and then it sort of died down, right? And um, it was a young man by the name of Sandeep uh, or Sunny Barar, you know, um, uh, of a Jaksik family who had basically decided to go on this murderous rampage, killing all his family members and killing himself. And he left behind, you know, what was a 17 page uh, suicide note where he talks um, quite eloquently about um, this sort of tensions that he felt about and the pressures that he felt um, to be a man, right? And particularly around um, uh, the pressure that he felt um, by his family to get married. And he was the only son. And I thought what was quite interesting in looking at the, the media reports around this particular incident was the repeated ways in which we were told that, um, you know, we couldn't make sense of this, this particular violent um, incident because there were you know, and the inspector comes out, you know, in the media report and says, there are no money problems, right? Okay, so it was not because of money. Um, there were, he was not under the influence of drugs, right? Which is often a, a thought of as like source of violence in Punjab. Uh, there were no family disputes, uh, you know, it wasn't about inheritance. He was the only son in the family, right? So he would inherit all the, the family's land. And this was a fairly landed upper middle-class family um, in a kind of rural village. And then he had family networks abroad. So he had a sister who lived in Canada and therefore, you know, the family was transnationally connected. Um, and the only thing that uh, the, um, the investigators could try to come up with was this, this issue of getting married and his refusal, his refusal to get married, which you know, the family was pressuring him to get married, you know, much in the same way in which the, the way my grandfather has pressured me over the, the past 10, 15 years to get married, the family was pressuring him and he sort of buckled under that pressure, right? And, and what's interesting is that um, uh, the, the, the media reports that followed or the kind of social media that followed couldn't just accept that maybe it is the kind of expectations of uh, uh, patriarchal masculinity that drove him to enact this form of violence. They had to then further kind of make sense of it through these other ways, such as, you know, maybe there's a sexual pathology, right? Like one of the ideas was like Shariki Bimari, you know, maybe he was homosexual, maybe he's asexual. So uh, in the kind of media reports, you know, uh, his masculinity is questioned because he didn't want to get married, right? Like we couldn't just accept the fact that like, maybe this is a young man who doesn't want to get married 
And, um, and again, uh, um, this is not to excuse the, the, the horrible, terrible, tragic violence that he unleashed on to his family members. But I do think that if we're trying to make sense of this violence, uh, we need to kind of think about what led him to, to enact this form of violence, right? And to sort of say that, oh, maybe because he was impotent. And in fact, what I found really interesting was eventually sort of the media reports ended up on this, like, because he was impotent. We don't know that he was impotent. You know, there was no, there's no uh, record of that, but that was what the, the kind of, um, the way in which it was um, justified that, well, maybe this might be the reason why he would enact such horrible violence onto his family, right? And I think this shows us the, the shortcomings in our society or the kind of inability in our society to be able to talk about masculinity in a, in a comprehensive, compassionate, uh, thoughtful, nuanced way that, uh, that we have to then render it as a kind of a form of sexual pathology that somebody doesn't want to get married, right? Um, and, and, and so that's when I talk about um, Punjabi masculinity, what I'm talking about simultaneously are these sort of failures of masculinity that we cannot seem to, to make sense of, or um, there are these contradictions of masculinity that we can't come to terms with, right? And I see these contradictions over and over again. I talk to many young men who don't want to get married, uh, uh, and these are heterosexual young men because they don't want to tie. They don't want to have this kind of burden of, you know, having to take care of your family and having to take care of your wife, having to take care of your kids, at least not for a while. And there's a lot of young men who sort of reject this notion of of patriarchal masculinity, and I find that very fascinating. So my work builds on, um, you know. A lot of scholarship, um, both feminist studies, Punjab studies, and Sikh studies scholarship in this area. Um, you know, um, I'm, I'm sort of interested in thinking about uh, the sort of Sikh male body as being historically uh, through the colonial period being um, uh, sort of held up as this exemplar masculinity, uh, you know, uh, particularly during uh, the British colonial army and British colonial period here, I'm talking about Kate Imey's work and um, Street's work about uh, where Punjabi Sikh men were in some ways held up as the kind of exemplar masculinity and particularly as a way of to kind of um, uh, render Bengali men as not so masculine in relationship to Punjabi men, right? And also um, how masculinity is, at least in Punjab, is something that is sort of crafted or marked onto the body. It's a kind of physical performance and physical manifestation of, of masculinity. And uh, it is, um, it's sort of signaled through these kind of coded um, uh, 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 ways and uh, coded images uh, of the way in which um, Punjabi Sikh man's body is um, represented on screen, right? Again, going back to this idea of images. And here, you know, I sort of build on the work of Radhika Chopra who talks about, um, particularly in rural areas, Punjabi men, their, their, their manhood is sort of crafted either on the field, you know, in through hard labor, you know, working on the fields, you know, this idea that, you know, it's kind of um, your, your, your masculinity is crafted through hard work, uh, through physical work, um, and then also uh, through, uh, you know, within the context of, of um, kind of these public spaces where young men, you know, talk to each other and, and kind of um, engage with each other around sexuality and masculinity. So there's it's a, the 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 way I sort of think about masculinity is something very it's a kind of very public display of of um, uh, of manhood, and also in context in addition to that um, you know I sort of think about uh, Punjab as patriarchal patrilineal patrilocal and what that has done to the way in which we think about land and inheritance, um, sun preference, dowry, violence, you know, and there's a number of people whose work I draw on, you know, Rina Oldenburg's work, uh, Navtej Pyotrval's work on sun preference, 
And even more recently, Amandeep Sandhu's work, who has written quite extensively about um, masculinity and inheritance in Punjab. And, um, and we see these representations uh, invade popular culture as well, particularly in Bollywood, right? Uh, when we think about um, uh, you know, the representation of Punjabi men in Bollywood cinema, in, in kind of context of Indian cinema, we always see you know, them wear with a turban on, you know, and a, a good example of that is a film like Singus King. And, 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 this asp and simultaneously with the aspiration of transnational mobility, right? Punjabi men are always represented as wanting to or aspiring to migrate abroad, you know, and uh, they're celebrated for their brawn, not necessarily their braininess, right? And um, I say that completely aware of the fact that uh, there are a number of times when I do go and do research in Punjab, and I tell them what my name is, you know, you get this sort of reaction, like, Achha, tu si vi, tu si vi jatto, you know, you know, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's this implication that, you know, you don't seem to embody that kind of masculinity that, that we think of as jatt men, you know, and, um, and so I'm really fascinated um, by, and much of my work, as I uh, have um, mentioned earlier, focuses on this kind of hegemonic Punjabi masculinity, which is defined as kind of jut masculinity, right? I mean, I don't need to go too much into uh, caste distinctions in Punjab, but, you know, we sort of understand caste as the sort of division between landed farmers, the Kisan and the Mazdur, you know, the landless laborers. And there's a tremendous amount of violence that is enacted by Juts on to non uh, non juts and um, there's a sort of emergence of the lit jut uh, Sikh identity, you know, which Surinder Jodka has written extensively about, and so I'm interested in uh, in uh, looking at hegemonic the definition of dominant hegemonic masculinity, which is typified and and sort of explored, particularly in Punjabi cinema and uh, Punjabi popular culture, through this identity of being jut and what it means to be jut. Right and Jats have always have 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 enjoyed um, kind of privilege. They became uh, uh, landowners because of the colonial period, and particularly because of the Punjab Land Alienation Act of 1900 and the colonial area uh, era policies around land distribution and allocation that privileged Jat families. You know, and that's some ways how my family, my extended family, came to acquire land and massive amounts of land that allowed them to be, um, you know, upper middle class or socially mobile, right? And, um, and even though Jets make up, uh, you know, a very small portion of, uh, um, of, of uh, you know, Punjabi Sikhs, uh, they have a disproportionate amount of power and privilege within uh, popular culture as well as um, uh, in, within the, um, uh, you know, uh, Punjabi politics, right? Uh, Juts have been historically um, overrepresented within Punjabi politics and popular culture. And so a lot of my works looks at the sort of visual images of, of Jat. What's really interesting is that in Punjabi cinema, a lot of cinematic representations of Jat, there's no compulsion to actually wear a turban, you know? And even sort of these early films of like Putta Jat and like a lot of the Jat farmers, they don't, they have short hair and, and their 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 claim to Sikhi is never questioned in the ways in which, let's say, a non-Jat's claim to Sikhi would be questioned if they didn't he he or didn't wear a turban and hair. But simultaneously, the turban also becomes this interesting marker within Punjabi cinema and popular culture as a way to kind of reincorporate oneself into the the rural landscape of home, you know, um, and and sort of, and it is a kind of um, that the shape and the style of turban also marks you as a particular caste of, of Punjabi man, you know, and as particularly landed status, right? And now it's become, it, there's a kind of revival of turban with Beljit Doshanj um, sort of having taken up this effort to sort of celebrate Punjabi turban. So I'm really interested in these kind of visual markers that define what it means to be a Punjabi man, you know, and, and I write a, a, about that as well. 
Uh, Juts are also the ones who are able to emigrate to places like US, Canada, UK, Australia in, in sort of more permanent ways because of these ongoing histories of migration, you know, and because they have the land uh, that can be sold to finance such migrations, whereas, you know, um, non Juts um, uh, from Punjab who young men who want to emigrate, many of them end up in Gulf, uh, in Doha, Qatar, you know, Dubai, um, places like that where they're pretty much itinerant laborers and they're exploited for their labor. There is no opportunity for them to be able to establish residency or citizenship, right? So again, the diasporic culture, uh, Punjabi diasporic culture remains dominated by uh, sort of Jat Sikhs as well. And, um, and, and so I sort of asked this question of um, what does it mean to be a dark sick man, particularly in this in moment in time when so many of uh, young dark men that I have talked to, they are no longer interested in farming, right? They're no longer interested in wanting to work the fields, uh, which has been traditionally the occupation that uh, young men um, were to judgment are to engage in to be successful man to be a successful man. So there's a changing definition of what being a successful man today in Punjab is right. And one of the ways in which I see migration plays into it is um, you know because farming has become um, not a lucrative uh, avenue for somebody to earn a living and sustain themselves and their family. The only way to then um, to, to engage in upward class mobility, to only way to have a successful career is through to go into a field, you know, to go into kind of labor fields because many Juts are not, they're not young Punjabi boys are not particularly motivated educationally. They're not, you know, they're not, um, they find it very difficult to compete with the sort of intelligentsia or the class of their um, in urban areas to be able to qualify for jobs that require advanced degrees. So the only way is to engage in labor. And because of their caste identity, it's almost seen as shameful to engage in certain forms of labor within Punjab, you know? So you'd never see a jack, or you'd rarely see a jack, a jack man, a son of a jack family driving truck in, Punjab, in India or in Punjab, yet that same profession or that same occupation that would be considered beneath them because of their caste identity is perfectly acceptable if it's done in the kind of diasporic setting or if it's done abroad. So engaging in doing that same kind of labor, if you do it outside, if you do, you know, in fact, this is true for uh, the United States as well as I think Canada today, the majority of the, the trucking industry now in in, in the United States and Canada is controlled by Punjabis, right? Um, it's dominated by Punjabis, that's the new profession. And so it's okay to engage in those same professions outside away from, uh, away from home. I also look at um, the construction of Punjabi masculinity within the context of um, histories of violence. Um, and then again, also transnational circulations of images from Punjab, uh, from the 1970s and 1980s, you know, as I said, um, my family comes, I come from a family of farmers, you know, um, and uh, especially having my, my mother and my father, my grandfather, having grown up in the kind of Malva region that was really affected by the Green Revolution. I have heard really interesting stories about the failures of Green Revolution in Punjab and how that led to this sort of agricultural collapse that, 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 sort of led to the militancy mo movement of 1980s, right? And I'm not gonna go too much into, into that because many of you are um, quite familiar with the, the sort of the political history of Punjab of 1980s, but I do want to reference the work of Brian Keith Axel, you know, who looks at, as he's an anthropologist, who looks at the transnational circulation of kind of tortured bodies and images images of um, militants who were tortured in the 1980s and how that circulation of those images produced um, this notion of, um, of, um, of um, diasporic culture and diasporic nationalism and led to 
you know, um, in some ways added to this notion of, of um, this desire for Khalistan and the Khalistan movement, right? And I also look at the work of uh, Radhika Chopra who talks about how the, what the events of 1984 uh, left a kind of collective hurt, uh, you know, onto um, Sikh psyche and, uh, you know, into the in Sikh community, which is still there because it hasn't really been worked out. It hasn't really been acknowledged. The state hasn't really acknowledged the violence that it enacted upon the Sikh community uh, during the 1980s. And as a result, there was an uh, um, insurgency in the 1990s. Now, what I find quite interesting, and this is actually from an article that came out a few days ago in the print um, uh, newspaper, is that uh, the Punjab's economy, contrary to the popular belief that uh, you know 1990s and nine were the you know the dark decade for Punjab, um, it actually was not so bad. Um, Punjab economy has actually dipped and failed more drastically. Um, you know the per capita income has gone down more substantially over the last ten years than it did in the two decades before that. Right, the decade of militancy as well as decade of, you know, and and I also, uh, you know, one of the ways in which uh, many families in, uh, dealt with this kind of economic instability as well as the political and and cultural instability and the religious insurgency at that time period, but was by sending young men um, out of the country, sending them abroad, you know, um, uh, because there is this notion that uh, land uh, in Punjab has become uninhabitable, right? This notion that land becomes pathological where um, it's, there's no longer this ability that one ought to, the only way to kind of survive as a young man in Punjab in the 1990s was to leave, right? And we see this notion um, reproduced within popular culture. Uh, you know, a film like Des Hoya for Days, which came out in 2005, is a story about a young farmer who gets caught up in the militancy. Of course, you know, um, film like Machis is a really good example of that, you know, where the, 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 your entire land has become toxic, right? It no longer can sustain you. And um, we also see that in representations of, um, of uh, artistic representations that are produced within diaspora and the way diasporic um, audience, a, a population thinks about Punjab even today. So here I'm referring to the work of an artist named Jagdeep Raina and his work Bonds, you know, and, and this piece where he does this embroidery and the, the title of the piece is There Are Corpses in the Rivers of Punjab. And it is evocative of that time period of 1980s where um, the relationship that young men had or and Punjabi families had with Punjab as a land, you know, as a as our dharti, was that it becomes toxic, it becomes dangerous, it's, it's no longer viable to actually live there, right? So the best thing is to do is to leave. And even though the insurgency has, you know, since ended, even though that political violence has died down, this notion or this attitude that Punjab is unsafe, right? That Punjab is no longer sustainable, the Punjabi land is no longer sustainable, still exists that tends to be one of the first um, uh, reasons that young men give to wanting to emigrate, right? They'll say things like, theta, you know, Punjab is um, koi safety nahi hai. Koi, uh, there's no law and order. There's no, um, there's no value for human life, right? And so often, so, so, Part of that is this residue of 1980s and 1990s. And there's a sense of insecurity. And part of that is also a kind of um, fear of the state, uh, of the Indian state to be able to mobilize that same form of violence again um, against Punjabi people and Punjab, particularly the Sikh community, right? There's a tremendous amount of insecurity. Um, and so, let me just go ahead and quickly move forward. Um, there's a tremendous amount of insecurity in Punjab um, that goes back to these histories of violence, you know, that we've talked about. And you see that again 
in the visual images that are circulated very casually over WhatsApp, right? Um, so things like this image that uh, you see above a Punjab Airlines that somebody has shared with me, it's evocative of the kind of displacement, the sort of political displacement that we saw in images from 1947. And I think there's an interesting parallel here that could be drawn. And uh, what this communicates is that, and, it, and this image almost looks, the, the above image of people sitting on top of a plane, almost looks like an image of refugees leaving um, a homeland that has been you know, contaminated or uh, uh, subjected to political violence, right? And the way Punjabis talk about migration, um, as opposed to other communities in India, is through this sort of particular ways of thinking about Punjab as a place that needs to be abandoned and to be, to be left behind uh, because of this sense of insecurity and distrust of the Indian government. Uh, so there is a kind of political motivation around it. Um, so I realize that I'm running out of time. So I'm going to go ahead and quickly move forward um, through this. So I want to show you a quick clip from Centerway Boys that explores this particular idea and really also looks at what happens to Punjabi villages in the absence of men too. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we arrive in, uh, in uh, New Delhi uh, International Airport. It's uh, 11, uh, 25 uh, p.m. local time. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we arrive in, uh, in uh, New Delhi uh, International Airport. It's uh, 11 uh, 25 uh, p.m. local time. ਤੇ ਉਹ ਦਿਨ ਇੱਕ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਇੱਕ ਤੇ ਸੁਪਨਾ ਬਣ ਕੇ ਉੱਡ ਗਈ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਕਿੰਨਾ ਵਧੀਆ ਖੁਸ਼ੀਆਂ ਦਾ ਕਿੰਨੀਆਂ ਖੁਸ਼ੀਆਂ ਹੁੰਦੀਆਂ ਸੀ ਉਸ ਘਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਤੇ ਜੋ ਅੱਜ ਉਹ ਘਰ ਇੱਕ ਇੱਕ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਕੰਧਾ ਘਰ ਬਣ ਕੇ ਜਾ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਘਰ ਬਣ ਕੇ ਰਹਿ ਗਏ ਆ ਅੱਜ ਘਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੋਈ ਨਹੀਂ ਇੱਕ ਕੱਲੀ ਮਾਂ ਬੈਠੀ ਆ ਬੰਜੇ ਤੇ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਦੇਖਣਾ ਚੰਗਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਲੱਗਦਾ ਇੱਥੇ ਤਾਂ ਹੁਣ ਦੇਖੋ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਕਿਸਾਨ ਮਤਲਬ ਹੁਣ ਆਪਣਾ ਖੇਤੀ ਵਾਲਾ ਕੰਮ ਵੀ ਜੇ ਆਪਾਂ ਦੇਖੀਏ ਬਾਅਦ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਟਾਈਮ ਨਹੀਂ ਚੱਲਣਾ ਜੀ ਇਸ ਲਈ ਉਹ ਸਾਰੇ ਇੱਕ ਦਾ ਸੁਪਨਾ ਇਹੀ ਆ ਵੀ ਮੈਂ ਬਾਹਰ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਕਿਤੇ ਸੈਟਲ ਹੋਣਾ ਕੋਈ ਸਟੱਡੀ ਬੇਸ ਤੇ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਕੋਈ ਦੋ ਨੰਬਰ ਬੇਸ ਤੇ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਕੋਈ ਵਿਆਹ ਕਰਾ ਕੇ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਹਰੇਕ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਇਹੀ ਆ ਵੀ ਮੈਂ ਇੰਡੀਆ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਹਰ ਰਹਿਣਾ ਜਾਂ There is such an almost absolute absence of men the household no longer becomes one in which agriculture continues in a sort of known way you know your lands are either rented out uh, more or less sold off even sometimes to finance uh, uh, the migration uh, so that sort of quite sort of changed the dynamics of how the village looks even nowadays you know ਮੈਂ ਕੁਝ ਮੇਰੇ ਫਰੈਂਡਸ ਆ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਇਹ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਕਿ ਤੇਰਾ ਐਟੀਟਿਊਡ ਜੋ ਹੋ ਰਿਹਾ ਉਹ ਇਹ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਤੂੰ ਟੋਰਾਂਟੋ ਜੈਸੀ ਪਲੇਨ ਤੋਂ ਉਤਰੇਗਾ ਤੂੰ ਆਪਣਾ ਸਮਾਨ ਸੂਨ ਸੇੜ ਦੇਣਾ ਤੇ ਕਹਿੰਦਾ ਯੇ ਮੈਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਆ ਕੇ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਭੁੱਲ ਜਾਣਾ ਸਭ ਕੁਝ ਅੱਗੇ ਵਿੱਚੇ ਕੁਝ ਯਾਦ ਨਹੀਂ ਰਹਿਣਾ ਤੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਤੇਰਾ ਸਮਾਨ ਚੱਕ ਕੇ ਤੈਨੂੰ ਫੜਾ ਦਾਂਗੇ ਉਸ ਟਾਈਮ ਤੇ ਕਿ ਬੇਟਾ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਇੱਥੇ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਨ ਆਇਓ ਜਲ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਮੇਰੇ ਏਜੰਟ ਨੇ ਆਈ ਡੋਨਟ ਨੋ ਕਦੋਂ ਉਹਨੇ ਪਰ ਟੋਰਾਂਟੋ ਡੈਸਟੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਲਿਖਣਾ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਉੱਥੇ ਤੋਂ ਮੈਂ ਡੈਸਟੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਉਹਨੇ ਟੋਰਾਂਟੋ ਲਿਖਤਾ ਤੇ ਟਿਕਟ ਵੀ ਹੁਣ ਟੋਰਾਂਟੋ ਦੀ ਹੋ ਗਈ ਹੈ ਹੁਣ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਤਾਂ ਫਿਰ ਦੇਖਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਟੋਰਾਂਟੋ ਹੀ ਬੁਲਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਫਿਰ ਟੋਰਾਂਟੋ ਜਾ ਕੇ ਦੇਖਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਉੱਥੇ ਕੀ ਹੈ 
ਟੋਰਾਂਟੋ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਦੇਖਣ ਲਾਇਕ ਬਟ ਐਜ਼ ਅ ਫਾਰ ਔਨ ਅ ਫਾਰ ਐਂਡ ਅਗਰ ਮੈਂ ਸਾਰੇ ਸ਼ਹਿਰ ਕੈਨੇਡਾ ਦੇ ਦੇਖਦਾ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਸੇਮ ਲੱਗਦੇ ਆ ਅਸੀਂ ਸਾਲ ਨੂੰ ਉੱਪਰ ਨਾਲ ਹੀ ਪਤਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿਹੜੇ ਵੇ ਹੁਣ ਮੈਂ ਕਹਿ ਦਿੰਨੀ ਆ ਵੀ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਰੋਲੇ ਹੋ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਕਹਿ ਨਹੀਂ ਵੀ ਅਸਲ ਵਿੱਚ ਤਾਂ ਸੱਚ ਹੋਣਾ ਮੰਦਰ ਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਬਾਅਦ ਚ ਵੀ ਦੱਸ ਦੇ ਵੀ ਚੱਲ ਤੇਰੀ ਮਾਂ ਜਾਂ ਮੰਮੀ ਤੇਰੀ ਬੀਬੀ ਮਰ ਗਈ ਇਹ ਨਾ ਵੀ ਬੀਬੀ ਇੱਥੇ ਪਾਈ ਰੱਖੋ ਤੈਨ ਦਿਨ ਸੱਚੀ ਗੱਲ ਹੈ ਜੇ ਤਾਂ ਕੋਈ ਮੌਕੇ ਤੇ ਆ ਜੇ ਤਾਂ ਠੀਕ ਹੈ ਨਹੀਂ ਮੇਰੀ ਮਿੱਟੀ ਨਾ ਰੋਲੇ as you can see the film explores this idea of how land families punjab is transformed in the absence of men right um uh, because of this sort of exodus of young men from punjab and how migration in some ways transnational migration in some ways not only changed their lives but also changed lives of the people who are left behind who are actually not moving and in many ways um it also sort of ask the question of how patriarchal culture and patriarchal traditions change in the absence of of men right like who's taking care of the family who's taking care of the land who's taking care of um uh, of elderly parents and who's going to cremate them when they die you know which is a question that even has come came up even in my family when my grandfather was getting you know he got uh, extremely sick and we knew that he was in a hospital and so we had to rush back to to be on his side and and also it looks at this journey of men from growing up in rural landscape moving to an urban place like chandigarh you know because if you want to go abroad it's not like you wake up one day and go to the the american consulate and be like hey can i get a visa this is a process there's a kind of you know there's a process of learning to become transnational right so when i talk about um the coming of age is a kind of an ongoing process this is one of the process right so so you bec- you grow up as a young man in in rural punjab you move to a ch- place like chandigarh where you become you learn how to become a transnational migrant right so uh part of that what i find really fascinating uh, in becoming the transnational migrant and this is almost universal in every story that i've 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 heard in my research is they often cut their hair first thing they do when they get to chandigarh is they young men cut their hair but yet they'll keep wearing the turban on and off depending on where they're going so when they go back home they put the turban back on you know when they come back to chandigarh they take the turban off and even in this last sequence where you see this young man his name is pali gurkirpal you know whose story i've been following his journey i've been following since 2009 all the way up into 2017 and 18 and then even in touch with him now you know he grew up in a very traditional amritdhari sikh family his family was very upset when he had cut his hair but he felt like it was really important for he to him to do that in order to kind of assimilate himself into the culture of the country that he was going to which is in canada you know he didn't want to 
And, and there is an expectation, particularly from young Punjabi men arriving in countries where they're going to be part of the kind of global labor force, that they are to kind of perform this very muted masculinity, like not don't call attention to yourself, don't wear a turban, you don't want to be racially profiled, you don't want to be, you know, discriminated against. So um, I talk about it in my um, essay, Transnational Hair and Turban, where I look at how young men, uh, transnational migrants use these um, sort of turban as a kind of a flexible form of, um, of citizenship, right? So in the absence of hair, you know, young men will put on the turban, you know, when they come back home. And it's not necessarily, I mean, the family knows that they have cut their hair, but this physical um, object that is now on their head um, allows them to reincorporate themselves into the landscape of home. And when they go abroad, they take it off, right? And we see these representations even in Punjabi cinema, where you see the, the main character who transforms himself very uh, drastically physically when he goes back home uh, to this Punjabi village and then is able to transform back very uh, drastically when he comes back to Canada, right? And so I'm really interested in this kind of, what are the, what are these co new codes of, of masculinity, uh, performances of masculinity that are required to become a, trans a successful transnational migrant, which is the definition of what it means to be in a Punjabi man today. Um, and lastly, I just wanna, I'll wrap up uh, very quickly. Um, I'm also interested in exploring um, sort of queer spaces of masculinity in Punjab, particularly in popular culture, right? And these exist despite, you know, um, despite thinking that we don't necessarily have these representations, these exist even in Punjabi cinema. And here I'm talking about queerness as a way of kind of deconstructing patriarchal masculinity and foregrounding transgressive gender performances you know, that sort of destabilize the, the gender binary. And we see that if we if were to kind of uh, take a kind of regional approach to queerness as Gayatri Gopinath does in her, her work, we see that within Punjabi films and uh, Punjabi popular culture. And in kind of regional registers, these are accept, these representations are accepted and even celebrated. You know, a good example of that is somebody like Mehar Mittal, who appears in the many Punjabi films, including Put Jatande, as a cross-dresser. You know, he's actively flirting with the, the lead character, you know, and um, yet at the same time, it doesn't challenge or destate, like it doesn't necessarily challenge the kind of masculinity of the main character, but it is sort of accepted as this kind of um, transgressive gender performance, right? Uh, even in a film like Long Dalishkara, which is an interesting film because if you look at it, it's a sort of story of a transnational migrant, one of the first stories of transnational migrant coming back home. And in some ways, it's kind of a, almost a love triangle between, you know, Raja, played by Raj Babbar, you know, Prito and uh, Channa. And, and, and there's a kind of homosocial uh, relationship between uh, Channa and Raja that is not necessarily defined as queer, but I think it can kind of, it, we can read it through queer registers. And in the end, Jenna has to sort of give his life. He, ha he, he, he sort of kills, he, he dies, you know, so that Raja and Prito can live happily together, right? And so if we think about, you know, um, Films like Shole, you know, and this sort of male bonding and that creates this kind of homosocial spaces. There are representations of that even in Punjabi cinema, right? Um, and again, if you think about a film like Marida Diva, which again uh, features a particular kind of masculinity. I haven't read the novel. I've watched the film many, many times, uh, uh, but it features a particular kind of masculinity that doesn't measure up to the sort of hegemonic definition of what a Punjabi man is supposed to be, right? And, and it sort of, again, features a sort of failure of Punjabi masculinity, a failure of what some people see as a particular failure of Punjabi masculinity, right? And, um, you know, and then also more regional films like uh, Family Kusriyadi in 2009 that came out uh, on DVD, you know, these kind of regional cultures. I, the argument that I make in my work is that we shouldn't dismiss these as kind of 
insignificant because these regional cultural forms are actually incredibly important. And what this film does is it sort of uh, draws on the kind of, um, uh, you know, traditional Punjabi cinema to kind of normalize um, in, in a kind of performative way um, being hijra in, in Punjabi society, right? And kind of create the space for uh, being a kusra in Punjabi society, right? And then also I've done a, um, more, my more recent work um, does an interview with um, this group called Noor Art Gidda Troop, which is quite popular in Punjab. Uh, they're based kind of around Jagrao area, and they are a group of uh, cross-dressing Punjabi men who live their lives as men, but also dress up as women and perform Gidda. And uh, they've done an exceptional job of actually um, sort of storing and maintaining uh, Gidda cultural forms that many of them are, are sort of even forgotten today, right? And they've done an incredible job of kind of preserving those uh, forms and they're invited often to various weddings and um, events and functions, you know, to perform Gidda and uh, to sort of engage, celebrate this form of uh, Punjabi femininity that in, in many ways is kind of even um, many Punjabi women, you know, no longer uh, has access to, right? So that's something that's sort of ongoing, this idea of kind of trying to explore Punjabi uh, queer, queer Punjabi masculinity in my work. So I'll stop there. I realize I'm, I'm out of time. I can talk more about that, but I'm happy to answer any questions. I do want to say that my website is harjantakil.com. You can see all my films uh, via my website. Uh, you can also read all the articles that I've written on my website. Um, so feel free to access those or email me if you'd like um, copies of any articles or things like that. So. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Gill, for such an engaging and enriching and comprehensive take on uh, uh, such a problematic notion as masculinity in Punjab and uh, its a complex relationship uh, with the transna transnationality and the way it is propagated and disseminated and reproduced in the mainstream popular media. Thanks, thanks a lot. So uh, now the time is for questions. We have a few questions. Uh, before we take up questions, I would like to uh, you know, share something uh, with you, Dr. Gill. So there is a song by Narinder Biba. Mm -hmm. The title of the song is uh, Malvich Rendiya Shukin Nariya. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, you know, I was uh, in my class and I asked the students, right, that if this song would have been written today, what would have been the lyrics? Mm -hmm. So most of them responded, Malavich Rendiya Shukin Jatiya. So this transformation from Nari to, you know, Jati is, is quite interesting. And this, this actually, you know, says a lot about... Uh, the culture of Punjab in the 1960s, in the 1970s, and the kind of, uh, you know, cultural production that was taking place during those times. I mean, the dominance of uh, Jat Six that we talk about today, uh, you know, is 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 an emergence of those times because invariably, whenever the references to caste is made, we go back to the British colonial legacy and uh, its long-term Im impacts. But, but it, it has not been as smooth uh, a trajectory as it seems right from the British colonial imposition of such things. So that, you know, all these things uh, are quite interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I completely agree with that. I find it very fascinating because, and part is also, part of, part of it is also, I was always told that, you know, to see, I see the judge sick hand, I mean, your gill, you know, judge sick and, I never quite understood. I remember watching uh, Put the Jatande in theater, you know, a long time ago in Chandigarh. And I never, I could never sort of um, uh, kind of make sense of, is this the kind of man I'm supposed to be, right? Growing up, this was the, always the question that sort of lingered out there uh, in my mind. And I never measured up to that, 
that expectation of like you're supposed to be this kind of of kind of representation of masculinity you're supposed to embody that and so I've always I think part of that is has led me to kind of um, inquire um so that has led me to this inquiry on and wanting to explore this Tamjit I think oh, he has a question. Yes, it's been a question. I was thinking about it, Arjant, you were listening to it. When you were listening to the documentary about migration, you were listening to it, 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 you were listening to it. But when you were listening to the first documentary, you were listening to it, ਮੈਨੂੰ ਜੀ ਉਹ ਮਹਿਸੂਸ ਹੋਇਆ ਕਿ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਹੀ ਇਹ ਤੈਅ ਕੀਤਾ ਕਿ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਹੁਣ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦੀ ਮਾਚੋ ਲੈਂਡ ਬਣ ਗਿਆ ਤੇ ਉਸ ਮਾਚੋ ਲੈਂਡ ਦੀਆਂ ਐਗਜ਼ਾਮਪਲਸ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਫਾਈਂਡ ਆਊਟ ਕੀਤੀਆਂ ਉਸ ਫਿਲਮ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾਂ ਸ਼ੋ ਕੀਤੀਆਂ ਪਰ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਉਹਦੇ ਪੈਰਲਲ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਪਈਆਂ ਨੇ ਕਿ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਹ ਸਪੇਸ ਵੀ ਹਲੇ ਬਚੀ ਹੋਈ ਆ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਫਲੂਇਡ ਆਇਡੈਂਟੀਟੀਜ਼ ਨੂੰ ਪਾਲਦੀ ਆ ਸਿਕਿਉਰ ਕਰਦੀ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਸਪੇਸ ਦਿੰਦੀ ਆ कि उस फिल्म ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਉਸ ਸਪੇਸ ਦਾ ਜ਼ਿਕਰ ਵੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਹੋਣਾ ਚਾਹੀਦਾ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਇਹ ਸਪੇਸ ਹਲੇ ਥੋੜੀ ਜੀ ਬਚੀ ਹੋਈ ਹੈ ਭਾਵੇਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਥੋੜੀ ਹੈ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਮੈਂ ਫੁੱਲੀ ਅਗਰੀ ਕਰਦਾ ਹਾਂ ਐਂਡ ਆਈ ਥਿੰਕ ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਫਿਲਮ ਸੀਗੀ ਉਹ ਸੋਰਟ ਆਫ ਇਟ ਵਾਸ ਮਾਈ ਫਰਸਟ ਅਟੈਂਪਟ ਟੂ ਕਾਈਂਡ ਆਫ ਐਕਸਪਲੋਰ ਥਿਸ ਥਿਸ ਆਈਡੀਆ ਆਫ ਮਾਚੋ ਲੈਂਡ ਯੂ نو ਦੈਟਸ ਵੇਅਰ ਦ ਦ ਆਈਡੀਆ ਆਫ ਮਾਚੋ ਲੈਂਡ ਫਰਸਟ ਸਟਾਰਟਡ ਫਰ ਮੀ ਐਂਡ ਤੇ ਉਸ 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 ਤੋਂ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਅਗੇ ਮੈਂ ਹੁਣ ਇਟ ਸੋਰਟ ਆਫ ਐਕਸਪਲੋਰ ਕਰਨ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰ ਰਿਹਾ ਹਾਂ ਰਾਈਟ ਥੈਟ ਫਿਲਮ ਇਜ਼ ਰੀਲੀ ਕਾਈਂਡ ਆਫ ਅ ਇਟ ਸੋਰਟ ਆਫ ਟਚਸ ਅਪ ਔਨ ਥਿਸ ਮਾਈ ਅਟੈਂਪਟ ਵਾਸ ਟੂ ਜਸਟ ਸੋਰਟ ਆਫ ਸ਼ੋ ਐਕਸਪੀਰੀਅੰਸਸ ਆਫ ਮੈਨ ਹੂ ਡੋਨਟ ਨੈਸੈਸਰੀਲੀ ਫਿਟ ਇਨ ਟੂ ਥਿਸ ਡੈਫੀਨੇਸ਼ਨ ਆਫ ਮਾਚੋ ਲੈਂਡ ਯੂ نو ਇਫ ਯੂ ਵਾਚ ਦ ਫਿਲਮ ਮਾਚੋ ਲੈਂਡ ਯੂ ਸੀ ਈਵਨ ਦ ਈਵਨ ਦ ਯੰਗ ਯੰਗ ਲਾਈਕ ਗਬਰੂ ਹੂਜ਼ ਰਾਈਡਿੰਗ ਦ ਮੋਟਰਸਾਈਕਲ ਯੂ نو ਈਵਨ ਵੈਨ ਯੂ ਸਟਾਰਟ ਟਾਕਿੰਗ ਟੂ ਹਿਮ he comes out with quite soft in his masculinity you know like he sort of talks yeah. about how he wants a girl who can like kind of hug him like a you know and give him the, give him the kind of love that his mother gives him yes yes hugs yes. him like a teddy bear you know and that felt really good and warm and mm. so i was really surprised by so what my what i was trying to do really also one of the the challenges with the film is also that you are limited by the amount of time that you have to produce the film particularly for PSBT because the commission was for half an hour film mm. and in half an hour it's very difficult to cover the extensive yeah. topics that I want to cover you know so i'm hoping that i will write about that in my book mm. but really that film was just an attempt to sort of showcase that uh you know Yes there is this definition of of masculinity patriarchal masculinity that we're all familiar with you know that we find problematic that we all struggle against there are many young men as well as many older men too who don't necessarily fall into that definition who reject that definition you know i think what's really interesting uh, one of the interesting stories was of goodpreet who has two daughters and you'd imagine that he there is a tremendous amount of pressure that he felt to birth a son because you know he had two daughters and and to decide to say like you know no i'm actually perfectly happy having two daughters i'm not i don't i i'm not going to give in to this this pressure to have a son or to have um you know an abortion my wife forced pressure my wife to have an abortion that speaks to this kind of different choices that men are making right and you're right that there it's happening in a very limited capacity right like there are examples of that are far few in in between but i do think that the point of that film was to show indian audiences as well as punjabi audiences that there are these other models that are available like we don't necessarily have to fit ourselves into this kind of model of of violent masculinity right like there are these other models that are available ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਆਪਣਾ ਟਾਈਮ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਤੇ ਧਰਮਜੀਤ ਦੀ ਮੇਰੇ ਖਿਆਲ ਕਨੈਕਸ਼ਨ ਦੀ ਪ੍ਰੋਬਲਮ ਆਈ ਪਰ ਲਾਸਟ ਸਵਾਲ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਤੋਂ ਪੁੱਛਣਾ ਚਾਹੁੰਦੇ ਆ ਕਿ 2016 ਚ ਫਿਲਮ ਬਣਾਈ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਮਾਈਗ੍ਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਵਾਲੀ ਆ ਤੇ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਮਾਈਗ੍ਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਆਲਰੇਡੀ ਬਹੁਤ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਹੋਣੀ ਸ਼ੁਰੂ ਹੋ ਗਈ ਹਨਾ ਤੇ ਹੁਣ ਤਾਂ ਬਹੁਤ
ਹੁਣ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਨੂੰ ਜਦੋਂ ਇੰਨੀ ਤੇਜ਼ ਗਤੀ ਨਾਲ ਸਾਰੇ ਲੋਕ ਛੱਡ ਕੇ ਜਾ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਹੁਣ ਮੁੰਡੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਕੁੜੀਆਂ ਵੀ ਨਾਲ ਹੀ ਜਾ ਰਹੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਤੁਹਾਡੀ ਫਿਰ ਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਜ਼ਿਕਰ ਆ ਕਿ ਮਰਦਾਂ ਦੇ ਜਾਣ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਹੋਊਗਾ ਤਾਂ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਕਿਹੜੇ ਵੱਡੇ ਖਤਰੇ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਲਈ ਦੇਖਦੇ ਹੋ ਇਸ ਚੀਜ਼ ਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਜਿਵੇਂ ਬਜ਼ੁਰਗ ਕੱਲੇ ਰਹਿ ਗਏ ਹਨਾ ਇੱਕ ਤਾਂ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਉਹ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਇੰਪੋਰਟੈਂਟ ਇਸ਼ੂ ਟੱਚ ਕੀਤਾ ਹਨਾ ਹੋਰ ਕਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਪੰਜਾਬ ਨੂੰ ਬਹੁਤ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਨੁਕਸਾਨ ਜਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਮੈਂ ਜਾਂ ਮੈਂ ਇਹਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਇਹਦੇ ਨਾਲ ਹੀ ਜੋੜ ਲੈਣਾ ਗੱਲ ਕਿ ਜਦੋਂ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਆਪਣੀ ਲੈਂਡ ਨੂੰ ਛੱਡਦੇ ਹੋ ਕਿ ਦੂਸਰਾ ਦੇਸ਼ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਵੀ ਤਾਂ ਇੰਨੇ ਸਾਲ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਕਦੇ ਆਪਣਾ ਦੇਸ਼ ਬਣ ਪਾਉਂਦਾ ਕਿ ਅਮਰੀਕਾ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਲਈ ਆਪਣਾ ਦੇਸ਼ ਬਣ ਪਾਏ ਜਾਂ ਕਦੇ ਬਣ ਪਾਊਗਾ ਆਈ ਥਿੰਕ ਇਹ ਇਸ ਵਾਲ ਬਹੁਤ ਹੀ ਕੰਪਲੈਕਸ ਐਂਡ ਕੰਪਲੀਕੇਟਡ ਹੈ ਇਹ ਇੱਕ ਕੋਈ ਈਜ਼ੀ ਆਨਸਰ ਵੀ ਹੈ ਨਹੀਂ ਰਾਈਟ ਆਈ ਥਿੰਕ ਫੋਰ ਦ ਮਾਈਗ੍ਰੈਂਟਸ ਦਾ ਆਈ ਟਾਕ ਟੂ ਐਂਡ ਆਈ ਐਕਸਪੀਰੀਅੰਸ ਯੂ ਨੋ ਮਾਈਗ੍ਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਇਜ਼ ਨਾਟ a some good or some bad right like there's it's it's not you can't think of migration as good or bad in that in that terms so you mentioned that a lot of young women are leaving and migrating abroad right um which is true and what's really fascinating now the trend is that you educate your daughters you almost over educate your daughters you send them because you know the boys are not not like they're not going to study they're not um going to put in the effort to be able to you know become a nurse or something so you educate your daughters and even the the kind of over education of the daughter is a way for men in the family to then further migrate right or then the expectation is okay um munde wale thode uh, uh, kudi da sara paisa bharange fisa bharange hmm. then she has to then take the husband yes. abroad and so 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 again it's part of that patriarchal system where women are used as channel for men to be be migrant but also simultaneously i think we can also acknowledge that it gives women more power and autonomy right like women have now they can say mm. you know no <laughs> you know or they can stand up to their husbands because right. they have more power and autonomy and i've seen that even in my own family right like uh, my is a uh, young women punjabi women are very uh assertive in claiming their space and their autonomy as well and so i think um so for women migration has been i think in some ways useful right if not good it has been useful um uh in, in terms of whether or not uh your home uh, abroad can ever be your home in some ways i think a lot of punjabis think about canada as an extension of punjab right there is a kind of project this political project of creating canada as a punjab that is no longer uh in um in reach of um the indian government right it gets the punjab that can exist outside of the nation where the indian government cannot control and that has been really fascinating the diasporic support has been really interesting to watch the kind of discourse that is produced in the in the aftermath of or during the the farmer protests that were happening in india right and the way in which it mobilized the diasporic community against the indian state you know and and it will be interesting to see how the indian state now responds to it now that the farmer protest has been successful so i think there are sort of you know many people do sort of see um diaspora as an extension of punjab and the the idea of transnational migration uh particularly as i featured in my film is not just about going it's also about coming back so you have to come back you have to invest in the the economy of home and unfortunately what that has done is it has let the punjab's politicians off the hook to kind of take care of the economy because on day to day level you have this uh remittances that are coming in you know everybody's the family's provided for you have you know families who have economic security because somebody's abroad who's sending money home but the local economy is in shambles it's there's no uh the 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 economy of punjab itself is poorly managed so it allows you know the politicians and the the ministers in punjab to sort of say like well look at people are driving audi cars what are you complaining about you know but the they don't address the fact that 
the roads that those Audi cars are dri being driven on are completely yes. falling apart. You know, like they'll sort of say, like you know, san as asita kina may international airport banate, international mall banate. You know, and and that's when you when you when you look at the rhetoric that was produced during the Badal administration, it was very much about this kind of trans international development in Punjab. You know, like. Amritsar International Airport, Mohali International Airport. There was an also, I think, a proposal to make Ludhiana International Airport, right? And it, this, it's this kind of development that is highlighted uh, that caters to the sort of diasporic audience um, at, the, at the, the detriment to the kind of real development that Punjab needs, which is of infrastructure. You know, in the meantime, the roadways, Punjab roadways, which unfortunately I... <laughs> When I travel in Punjab, I travel on Punjab roadways buses, you know, and uh, they are completely in shambles, right? Um, the, the infrastructure is falling apart. Meanwhile, it allows, so that's the problem, I think, and that's a big problem in, in Punjab that remittances in some ways hides the kind of real dire story of Punjab that's happening right now, which is this, this almost economic collapse, which is a result of mis years and years of mismanagement. You know, but there's no reason why Punjab should be in this economic place right now, given the kind of um, uh, production capacity that we have in terms of uh, the, 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 the agricultural output, right? And even the agricultural sector, we, I mean, there needs to be reforms. We, I mean, every, every economist that I talk to, agriculture economist that I talk to agrees with that, like Punjabi agriculture economy needs to be reformed. But the kind of reform that Modi government was trying to impose, you know, was very draconian and without any consultation with the Punjabi farmers, and there was a kind of rebellion against it. So it hasn't that that issue hasn't been resolved yet, right? Like farming is still kind of a a, a losing um, proposition, especially with climate change. And um, there is so. uh, there is an interesting question which I also wanted to ask you. So yeah. this uh, question is uh, from Ashima Walia. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is, what kind of impact will there be of the one year long Kisan Morcha on masculinity in Punjab? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, uh, that's... <laughs> I mean, do, do, do you see, because why, why this question, why I also wanted to ask this, you this question, because there was a very predominant cultural discourse that was created around this movement that we'll be seeing a radical, you know, transformation of uh, Punjabi society, including masculinity, yeah. Yeah. right? So do you see that the movement will have, you know, yeah. positive impact? I, I, I do, I do. I think um, the movement has already had positive impact because it has allowed, it's, it's given, um, uh, sort of a glimpse into social empowerment to Punjabi youth, right? Many, much of the Punjabi youth who were, you know, the generation who was born after 1984, you know, who uh, were not maybe not that politically mobilized in the 1980s and, and sort of grew up in 1990s and in the early aughts with um, this sense that everything is provided for them. You know, they don't have to work hard. Uh, they don't have to work very hard to be able to uh, to get what they want, now they're for the first time they're experiencing um, this what it's like to be part of this movement, this kind of political movement that's greater than than them, right? Um, that's that has this kind of it, this this empower this um, feeling of empowerment, having accomplished something against the state, right? So I think I do think that there are sort of positive impacts there, and I hope that it will inspire young men uh, to be more politically motivated. Um, but at the same time, I do see there's this a sort of an erasure of women who were involved in, women and also uh, non-Jats who were involved in the farmer morcha. You know, uh, I think that's, a, that's something that we need to really pay attention to that, uh, particularly in the, in the cultural productions, you know, all the songs, and the music videos that were coming out that were around uh, the, the support of the farmers, they almost entirely highlighted the duck man as the, you know, it's like the, it's like that image of the, um, the man who's like being bombarded with the water cannon and he has like his 
baal dikh rahe hoye hain aur chhati khulli hai you know like it's it's a kind of it's it's reproducing this kind of masculine discourse whereas we know that a, a big reason why this this movement was successful was because of the women who took a very active role in supporting the farmer movement you know and because of and and because of the non jats the laborers the the mazdoors who are actually doing the work in punjab of cultivating land they were part of that movement right and they don't necessarily have the at least from far it seemed like there's they don't necessarily have the kind of recognition that that jat men have received um in the in the kind of aftermath of this movement and so i hope that there would be some more acknowledgement of their their struggles as well you know because this was definitely a outcome of a kind of a coalition of people who rose up against the state which i think is an incredible accomplishment it should not be diminished right like the farmers what the farmers and the farmers have been able to achieve i certainly thought that it wasn't going to be possible <laughs> uh i was skeptical my parents were very much adamant about it they were sending their money to khalsa aid and all the various organizations uh but it's really it's been really impressive to see what they've accomplished and i think this will hopefully be it will sort of have an impact down the line okay so i think uh, let's uh, end the discussion on a positive note and we all hope that things will work out finally in the future towards a bright and uh, egalitarian future uh, right so now i will i would like to propose the formal vote of thanks uh, i'll start with the uh, professor gill uh, for uh, giving us his uh, time and for uh, you know initiating this uh, discussion on masculinity and i think uh, the moment we start talking about masculinity it implies that we are already talking about human sexuality female sexuality asexuality all these categories that are related to this thing called masculinity so i think uh, we need more such discussions when it comes to punjab punjabi culture and the kind of cultural production that takes place in punjab not only from the diaspora but from 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 within punjab also i would also like to thank uh, professor admin who is always there to support us and who has been supporting us and who has been participating in most of our discussions and lectures uh, and he's always there whenever we invite him i would like to you know Uh, extend my thanks to professor arvin i would also like to thank professor gurmukh director center for diaspora studies for encouraging all of us to keep organizing uh, you know such uh, uh, engaging lectures and, and keep inviting such young scholars like professor gill i would also like to thank uh, sukhdeep ji our technical support who is always there uh, with us to help us sort out technical glitches uh, thanks uh, sukhdeep ji and i would also like to thank all those people who joined us uh, on our youtube live telecast page uh, thanks everyone and see you next time